This is Robert Kraft, and I am your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. And with me today is a really special guest. Uh, I know some of you have probably uh, heard him speak before on many other podcasts, and but probably more notably is have read his book because uh, I think for most of us, <laughs> his book was one of our first investing books. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Jim O'Shaughnessy. He's the chairman and co-CIO of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Robert. Looking forward to it. It's it's great to have you on, and and really, I, I know you're you're super busy, so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time here. My pleasure. So, um, you know, to get started, uh, I'd love to get your background. You know, I, I know again, a lot of people probably know a, a good amount of your background and and how you got to where you are today. But for those who don't, you know, let's let's kind of get that full picture. Sure. So I, I became interested in the stock market as a teenager. Um, because uh, I, I, I come from a family, my grandfather was super successful uh, in the oil business, and then he kind of pulled a, a Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, before Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, and gave away like 95% of his fortune during his own lifetime, which I'm immensely proud of. But that which he didn't give away went into a foundation, a charitable foundation, mm -hmm. and my dad and his brothers and sisters were the trustees. So they would have a quarterly meeting and then have a dinner. And when I got old enough, they let me sit in on the dinner, which I was always psyched because, you know, the conversations in an Irish household uh, can be very interesting. Um, and, and one night, my dad and my uncle got into it over a stock. And, and this was obviously a continuation of what they'd been talking about at their meeting. And it was about IBM. And... They were like going at each other. And, you know, as I listened, though, it was like all about personalities. It was all about the CEO. It was all about Watson and, you know, his think slogan and all that kind of stuff. And I just kind of thought to myself and interjected, you know, uh, no disrespect, Dad or Uncle John, but I don't think that's the way you should value a stock. Uh, I think the way you should maybe value a stock is like by what are the numbers, right? And they just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. Now, you got to remember, this is 1978 and no one had heard of a quant or uh, factors or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Um, so I got very ambitious and decided I was going to go, I was going to look into this stock market stuff. And so I went, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. And so I went down to the James J. Hill uh, Library, which was a research library and I brought an actual spreadsheet. You're way too young to have probably ever even seen one of these, but it was like one of those huge paper spreadsheets. And I thought, oh, I'm going to look into the, you know, the S&P 500. Well, <laughs> uh, when, when you marry that with my natural laziness, I decided that it was probably far better to do the Dow Jones Industrial Average, mm -hmm. only 30 stocks, et cetera. So I listed all the uh, Dow stocks going back in time. There was a book there that showed which stocks were in the Dow at what, during what years. And I listed everything, right? Price, PE, dividend yield, book value, all of that kind of stuff. How old were you? I was 18. Okay. Um, and then uh, I, I quickly tired of that as I was going into my senior year of high school and had a girlfriend and, uh, you know, that was getting really boring. Uh, but, you know, it's funny. I, I came back to it when I was in my 20s uh, found found the spreadsheet, found all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta start doing this again. So uh, that led me to um, write an article actually for Barron's uh, called uh, High Yields, High Returns about the old dogs of the Dow strategy, um, which I'll get back to in a minute because it shows how things change, right? And you gotta always try to stay on top of research. Um, anyway, uh, I wrote a book called Invest Like the Best, showing you how you could clone your favorite money manager because that became it, this became my career, right? And as I was writing that particular book, I thought, wouldn't it be great to have like a list of showing all of the various uh, things that people, uh, active investors look at, right? Like PE, growth rates, et cetera. And if we could test that over a long period of time, that would be fantastic, right? Because I, I, there's no book on it now. Obviously, in hindsight, I know there was a lot of pretty good academic research on it. French Fama, very famous, right. uh, Lacanachoc, et cetera. 
Uh, but that's what led to what works on Wall Street and kind of the rest is history. What works came out uh, in the uh, 1996, the first edition, and quite literally, you know, your average investor was like, whoa, what's this? And so my original company, O'Shaughnessy Capital Management, basically got about $500 million in assets under management that came over the transom to us. No outgoing phone calls, right? Because people had seen the book. And, um, you know, now we find ourselves uh, here. We, here we are. So, so I got to ask you, going back to when you did that very first spreadsheet, when you said, you know, dad, unk. You know, uh, sorry, that was short for uncle. I, you know, yeah, no, I know. That's fine. Okay. All right, just make, just make it sure. And uh, <laughs> you know what? Why did you tell them? What inspired you to say, you know, guys, you guys should look at the numbers? I mean, where did that come from? Uh, that's that's a great question. Um, so, I've always been fascinated by how things work, and uh, you know, kind of early on. Uh, I, I became a big fan of uh, Lewis Carroll, whose real name was Charles Dodson. Most people don't know that he was the logician, right? That was his formal training. And he's written a lot, he wrote a lot of academic work, right, about logic and, and, and how you should approach trying to figure things out. And so I was into guys like him and, and, and others and, and quickly kind of developed a systems theory of trying to figure things out, right? Don't, in other words, don't look at like the story. Don't look at, you know, what, what people are. I was also a magician when I was a teenager. So I knew all about misdirection, right? And so it kind of naturally sat in my brain that hmm, maybe that CEO is telling me what to look over here because he doesn't want me to look over here. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of developed a theory that I actually wrote some term papers about, about how you could understand things much better by understanding their underlying structure, right? I wrote a piece in 1982 of all things about why the USSR had to collapse. And it was because literally I was only looking at the underlying structure. I wasn't looking at any of the propaganda or any of that kind of stuff. I was looking at the structure of their system. And, you know, it was a, it was a structure that was built on sand. And, you know, you, you could keep it going for only so long. Um, and so probably that. Right. So probably, you know, that that was where my thinking was at. And so when I heard him arguing about, you know, a stock and then everything was a story. Right. Um, and a narrative. And, a, you know, this is my opinion. Right. Um, and and so I kind of instantly went, no, what's the underlying structure? And I think that's that's why I kind of popped off. They didn't appreciate it, by the way. <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, I'm sure they're just like, get, the, we invite you to one dinner and now you're, you're, te you're telling us how we should look at stock. Get, get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, no, I was a cheeky bastard. There's no question about it. I, you know, I kind of was from when I was a kid, I found a tape that my father had uh, made. He interviewed me you know, when I was seven years old uh, and just to put it into context. I have a six year old grandson now. Right. Um, and so anyway, uh, I listened to this tape and, and he's saying, well, Jim, uh, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, I don't know, but I'm going to be really successful. And he goes, well, are you going to have a yacht? And I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> and, and, and then he goes, well, what if what if I tell you that I don't like yachts and I, I don't want to go on that yacht? And my response to him was, who said I was going to invite you? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good stuff. It's uh, cheeky built into the uh, into the DNA. Listen, we've only been talking for ten minutes there, and I I, I think I don't know if anything's changed. I think I I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the cheeky, not the bass part, the cheeky part. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right, okay. Right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so you know, uh, again, you guys have been around for a while uh, with O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, and you know, on uh, going to your website and really going through your actual investing philosophy and where you guys are at today, you know, for both strategies, you know, on the website, it states that the investment philosophy is that, you know, you guys have conducted research covering more than 50 years of market data to identify the characteristics that have historically led to strong selection. You know, I, I'm just curious, you know, uh, can you elaborate on how you've melded empirical fundamental research and quantitative equity strategies for stock selection? 
Sure, absolutely. Um, and that will bring me back to that story about the dogs of the Dow. So the Dogs of the Dow was a strategy that was advocated by three different books. A friend of mine, Harvey Knowles, had written one of them. Um, uh, O'Higgins was the most famous uh, for it. And, and that strategy was very simple. It said you take the 30 stocks in the Dow, you buy the 10 that have the highest dividend yield, you hold them a year, and then you rebalance that process. And I tested that back to the creation of the modern 30 stock Dow in 1927. Um, and it really worked worked very, very well. Well, things change though, right? And, and that's one of the key elements that we believe in passionately. You can't just do research and then put it in a box on a shelf. You've got to continually try to up, uh, update and upgrade the research you're doing because things change, uh, not fundamentally, right? We still believe that the reason quant works is because it short circuits emotions, right? Uh, but but for example, dogs of the Dow, dividend yield became a lot less important. Buybacks became a lot more important, right? And so we developed a new dogs of the Dow that looked at shareholder yield, which is dividend yield plus buyback yield, right? That worked really, really well. Um, but so how, how we marry fundamental with quant is, is pretty simple actually. What we do is we are continually, we have a fantastic research team and, you know, they are voraciously curious. And as am I, as is Patrick, who's the CEO, and it's like, well, what about this? What about this? Have we thought about this? And so you mentioned you've been to the site, right? And you see a lot of things that you might not normally see, for example, a challenge to price to book. Uh, written by Travis Fairchild, one of our portfolio managers and a member of the research team, um, and how price to book isn't working as well because the underlying structure of companies today has changed dramatically. And there's so many intangibles, right, that they're not being valued. They're not being captured by price to book at all. And so we use a composite of value factors uh, in most of our strategies. Uh, my original research and the current edition of What Works on Wall Street shows the results of a compositor, actually three, um, and price to book is in there, right? And, and now it's not because of the research that we continue to do. So what we do is always try to push forward on, on getting better definitions in the factors, getting better uh, ideas about things, but what we don't do is our foundational ideas remain unchanged, right? Pr value, uh, quality, you know, shareholder yield, momentum, you know, those have worked in very, now we, we, we do the factors differently, right? Than we used to, that's the evolution part. But the, the, the thing that I think really allows us to uh, do well over time is we let we if if our various models say buy this stock we buy it if they say we do what's called dynamic rebalancing which is monthly we rerun the screens right and so if a stock shows up in all 12 months guess what it gets overweighted in the portfolio so it becomes a conviction name um if it doesn't it's underweighted in the portfolio and same with selling right so if, if uh, a stock shows up on the sell list, we just sell it. We don't say, oh my God, I love that stock. I really, really hate to see that one go. We literally, it's, it's like when we look at the stock market, what we see is, you know, the matrix in, uh, with, with the, the lines going down. That's kind of the way we, we see things. It's like, you know, we really don't care at all about narrative, we think most narrative is misleading and done after the fact, right? It's like, look at any headline, and I always joke about it on Twitter, right? But it's like, you know, you could program an AI and you wouldn't notice the difference, right? Stocks today rally because Biden won, and, you know, and if Biden had lost, stocks rally because Biden lost. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, 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 people crave narrative, right? And, and they, and there's a great book um, by Malcolm Gladwell. It's his it's his most recent one, and it's it's in it's called Talking to Strangers. Right. And and one of the things that he uh, highlights in that book, which I think is another reason why this approach works so well over time, 
is because we have what he calls a default to honesty. What does that mean? It means that as part of our evolution, as part of our DNA, human beings default to believing the person that's telling them something. And if you think about that for a minute, well, we better, because if we didn't, you know, it would be Mad Max, Thunderdome, right? Because if we didn't trust other people and, and, and trust them enough to work with them and, and create a society, et cetera, things would be very bleak indeed. The problem, of course, comes when people are lying to you, right? And so when you default to honesty, you don't really look for that lie. Well, numbers, right? The numbers, now, of course, they can fake the numbers, right? And if those are fake, then you know you might get caught up thinking of Enron here. But Enron scored horribly on two of our factors that precluded it, right? So, so interestingly enough, we just think you get to a much clearer picture by ignoring narrative, by ignoring emotions, by ignoring all the things that we think trip up investors and doing continual research. Finally, I will add, I think that you can judge the quality, at least this is so self-serving because we've got a big one, but uh, in, in what we call the research graveyard. That is all the things that we tested that didn't work, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, and as you listen to this, you're going to think, wow, that probably that sounds like a good idea. Um, and, th and that is um, we thought, well, I want we wonder if companies where the founder is still a big owner and is still running it. We bet that those companies do a lot better than companies that where that isn't the case. Uh, so that was our hypothesis. Tested it. We were wrong. Didn't didn't work. Um, so a lot of that's the other thing for people listening. I mean, a lot of what sounds intuitive, right, ends up being wrong. So so I did a thing for what works on Wall Street. It's like, hey, uh, do you think you'd be interested in the stock uh, or stocks that have uh, uh, grown their sales the most over the last five years? Well, that sounds pretty promising, right? Not promising at all. Actually, over long periods of time, worse than T-bills. Why? because those stocks get super popular. People price them to perfection. Perfection very rarely happens. They disappoint and people bail, you know, faster than you, know, you, you can say, uh oh. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of our approach. It remains the underlying foundation remains the same. The way we define things, et cetera, changes continually. Well, I wanted to follow up on that point. Like, what would you say are the you know, you say that that the, the value factors sometimes change or yeah. usually change over time. What would you say have been the most dramatic changes to some of those value factors? So, so the importance of free price cash flow um, uh, uh, is uh, really stunning. Um, that's something that, you know, if you were poking around 15 years ago, you probably wouldn't see even academics looking too much at it. Um, and uh, that that has been a big change. The uh, disintegration of uh, the value of a price to book or book to price uh, ratio uh, is pretty stunning, actually. Um, and again, that that is a, probably due to this systemic change in the way companies are are operated today, right? So brand value, intangibles, those things are hugely important in today's modern economy, right? Um, and, and they don't get captured in price to book. Uh, so uh, what we always try to do is we always, for, you know, we're, we're always, everything we do is probabilistic. Meaning, uh, I, I used to joke that we are deterministic thinkers living in a probabilistic world, right? And, and that gets us into all kinds of trouble. Right. And and so we're very probabilistic. We look at, OK, what's happening here? Oh, look, it's disintegrating. Wonder why that is. Uh, and we, we do a deep dive, usually find a reason. Um, there's a great paper by one of our O'Shaughnessy research partners who writes under the uh, pseudonym Jesse Livermore um, on our site, uh, which takes a look at why uh, prices do what they do. And it's like a tour de force. 
Um, so uh, lots change, but I, I, I want to emphasize underneath it all, not much has changed at all, right? So for example, you're a micro cap uh, guy. I love micro cap. It's our it's my favorite portfolio. And it's my favorite portfolio because scarcity, right? Uh, uh, when, when, when there is so little in people looking at things and, and analyzing them, we love spaces like that, right? Because if, uh, if you were going to buy like the Russell microcap index, I'd say don't do it because it, it, it can a it's not really a micro cap right <laughs> b it contains all of the stocks 80 percent of which are horrible horrible mm -hmm. that's the other thing we love about micro cap is that there are diamonds in the rough and man they're real diamonds and they're very shiny but you gotta search for them so um in in the case of our micro cap strategy it's half momentum based right so growth oriented right. and half value based right so you can pick up uh, in lots of really, really interesting companies where virtually no analyst coverage. Um, so lots of inefficiency, right? Um, and uh, that's a place where, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are micro cap aficionados and they're like, but Jim, you know, this is the place where it's got to be pure fundamental analysis. And I'm like, sorry, man, uh, factors work beautifully down here because nobody is looking at them. Right. And you get these crazy uh, deviations. Right. A company that, you know, might have increased earnings, uh, you know, 100 percent year over year for the last three years. And it's still priced at a P.E. of eight. I mean, that's fantastic. I'm not so much. I mean, I, I, I just maybe not so much anymore, but <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there's still a few that, that are out there like that. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny when you say this, because I've done a few interviews with you know, people who start off, started off as individual investors and really focused in on micro caps. And now, you know, they have a family office or they have their own fund sure. and they have multiple millions under management. And I thought of this this morning when I was thinking about bringing you you know, for our interview today, I was like, yeah. you know, you, you remind me you, that that subsect reminds me of that pro athlete that, you know, goes back and does a pickup game when they think about their, you know, micro cap investing upbringing, <laughs> just like, ah, oh, I just want to go. I wish I could go back to those days and just, you know, just pick individual stocks and I, nobody watching me, man. This is this is the best, you know. <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing that's so great about microcap, right, is is we have a strategy that's still open. Um, why it's still open is baffles me, honestly, because it's done very, very well uh, over long periods of time. Um, but, you know, you're right. It's that's it's fun. It's really fun seeing these companies, and you're just like, how how can this how can this be priced like this? And it well because you know there's nobody looking at it. And as you say, once you get a family office, once you get all that kind of stuff, it's just a it's a tiny it 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 doesn't move the needle too much, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like uh, Bob Stansky when he ran the Magellan Fund uh, was friendly with me, and we got in for, together for lunch, and he's like, hey, will you do me a favor? Will you send me the list uh, from from that small cap growth portfolio that you that you that's been doing so well? And I said, sure, send it to him. And then I went up to Boston and we went to lunch and he brought the list with him and he goes, he puts it down and he goes, y you know what the tragedy is here? He goes, I could buy every name on this list in the Magellan Fund and it wouldn't move the needle, even if they all went up like 50 percent that year. And so. That's another asymmetry, by the way, that's great for individual investors, right? For the most part, you're not competing against guys like me, right? We have a fund and there are some other funds, but, you know, it's a passion, right? Uh, m most of the what I call commercial asset managers, right? Um, you know, it's uh, assets over portfolio um, uh, construction, right? They, they, they're asset gatherers um, and they're not like you know, it, it, it just leads to different decisions, right? So you, you you very rarely see some of these monster asset managers with any microcap strategy because they'd be shrugging their shoulders like, why would we bother, right? With me, we bother because, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I love microcap stocks. So I got to ask, you know, because you know, there's probably a few people that are listening to this, like, 
Jim, we love you. We love your passion for microcaps. And, you know, we love the idea that you can actually have a quantitative approach to investing in microcaps. But what would you say to those who, like, for instance, I've had a few people on recently that are very focused on pink sheet stocks or companies maybe that are more dark and don't have, there's not as much data. I mean, can you still apply some of that quantitative approach to some of those companies or is it obviously a little more difficult? So that's a, that's a really interesting question. It's actually one that uh, came up not too long ago. Um, and the way we solve for that is um, we have made investments in um, uh, people who do private uh, company transactions, mm. right? Um, so they're they're not even on the pink sheets. And um, we, we did that uh, instead of trying to get down to the, the pink sheet level, this for O'Shaughnessy Family Partners, which is our family office, right? right. Um, because when we were looking at the pink sheets uh, and, you know, the the lack of data, the the sketchiness sometimes of the data sometimes um, <laughs> made it for us at least um, you know eh, we're not going to go there um, now look I'm also there there are many paths to heaven right I I happen to believe very passionately in being a quant because more honestly because it short circuits all of the emotional. Uh, problems that we have when faced with investing, right? But there are other people, right, who I have some good friends um, who are pure fundamental guys, right, in the microcap space, and they've done very well. And, you know, I, 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 I'm, there is not a one size fits all in investing. Right. And, you know, it's like people often ask me, well, Jim, what's the best strategy? And, and, and I answer the best strategy is is one that you can stick with through thick and thin and that you're comfortable with, right? That, that you feel, yeah, that's right for me. And that's very different for very different people, right? So like I have a huge appetite for risk and I always have, I, you know, no risk, no risk premium. <laughs> and, and so there are other people though that um, would like freak out if, if they had to take that kind of risk. And so when I was younger and designing all of the strategies for, for my original company, O'Shaughnessy Capital Management, I was, you know, I was in my 30s, early 30s. And I'm like, I'm going to design all these strategies for me. <laughs> right? And so they, they had massive alpha, but they also had massive swings. And, you know, uh, reality came and knocked and said, hi, Jim, we want to have a little chat with you. <laughs> Most people don't like that. And, and, you know, as I thought about it over time, it's just I've come to the position that you got to do what feels right for you, right? And, and so if you're a, a pure fundamental guy, right, and, and, and you, you, you want to use intuition, you want to use all those things, try to saddle a person like that with a quant process, which is highly, uh, you know, mechanical in nature, it's not going to work. Right. Just like asking me to, you know, listen to what a company CEO has to say. I, it's not going to work because I'm so programmed in my mental maps. Right. That uh, this person is lying to me. <laughs> and, and so, you know, different strokes. Right. No, of course. So, you know, I, I actually just saw you speak at the, uh, the Microcap Leadership S Summit in Chicago. Speaking of, you know, very successful microcap investors, yeah, I think yeah. that's probably that's one great. of the. Oh yeah, I, I'd say it's probably the greatest gathering of successful microcap investors. Yeah, it was a great. Yeah, he, he that was really a great conference. Oh, it's the best. And uh, so shout out to Ian and Mike. Uh, just yep. want to make sure that they're uh, you know uh, I'm just very thankful. I'm going back again in 2020. Um, and during that that uh, during your speech, I mean, you provided some of the best sound bites. I I, I think you might I think you liked and retweeted a few of my. I, I was doing some live. Uh, uh, stuff, you know, uh, I think, I think if this doesn't ever work out, I, you could hire me to be like the live, like uh, quote person, <laughs> you know, about uh, Boswell and Johnson, right? Boswell yep. followed uh, Samuel Johnson around and he's who made Johnson famous. <laughs> it wasn't <That's> Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to ask you about it, uh, a few of, well, you know, I know you don't have too sure. much time, but I have to ask you about a couple of them. So sure, sure. Th there's one that you said that you actually alluded to a little earlier that I think was my favorite one you said, you know, you said human nature hasn't changed in millennia, and, and there's your edge. 
Fear, greed, hope, and ignorance are the four horsemen of the investing apocalypse. So <laughs> I, for those who weren't there for the speech itself, love to hear you, know, you elaborate a little bit more on this. Sure. So, you know, everyone is, well, not everyone, a lot of people are, are trying to say, you know, the, there is no edge left in the market, right? There, everything you've got, you've got the algos, you've got uh, the uh, information efficiency, the, the, the uh, amount of data available, et cetera. And so that led me to come up with that line, which is, you know, markets change minute by minute human nature barely changes millennia by millennia, there's your edge. You, you know, you're the last, last sustainable edge is arbitraging human nature. And by that I mean the crisis, well, okay, let's take the, the current times we have right now, right? So coronavirus, a new threat, right? So how do human beings react to new dangers as opposed to old dangers. Well, you can study it, right? Old dangers, they get inured to. They don't worry about it, right? So it might be vastly more uh, statistically probable that you're going to die of the regular flu than, than this particular flu. Uh, but we get freaked out when something new as a threat comes, right? It's baked into our DNA. And so the idea of arbitraging human nature is we look markets day to day unpredictable human nature day to day highly predictable and and so when when you see things like the sell off or the run up uh, you go back to the financial crisis and look at that you go back to the dot com and look at that it's fascinating because it's the same if you understand investing history right you go back, it's like we have a guy here who that's what he does, right? He does all the financial history because when you go back far enough, you see same thing. So railroads, what did investors do? They overbid them. They got excited. It was a brand new technology. This is going to change everything. And of course, crash and burn. And not just once, twice, three times, right? And then what did they do? They did the same with radio, RCA. They did the same with motion pictures when they uh, came out with the first talkie, right? What did they do? They they bid up, uh, I think it was Warner Brothers. Uh, it was up, I don't know, 550% because what's predictable is that when, when interesting good things happen, right? We get so pumped up and we get so excited about it. Like the dot com, that was like amazing because it was pure mimetic behavior. And that's another thing I'm into, right? Which is mimetic behavior is basically means you copy other people. Mm -hmm. And if you study mimetics, you understand that mimetics drive a ton of human behavior. And, and so I, I always said, you know, in line with the, the quote about arbitraging human nature is that, you know, the stock market is a complex adaptive system with feedback right? And normally it's relatively efficient because people's views are heterogeneous. In other words, you might sell me a stock and I'm buying the stock, right? And we can both be right. You're selling it for a different reason than I'm buying it, right? And so heterogeneous opinions are very important to auction markets. You got to have a lot of different opinions, right? Because then things net out and that's why people who believe in price uh, contains everything, right? The efficient market crew, um, they they have some good arguments when things are heterogeneous. Right now, things are not always heterogeneous, right? Sometimes the what I call information cascades start, and an information cascade is where suddenly everybody is saying and thinking the same thing at the same time, and this information cascade causes homogeneity to opinions. In other words, everybody's thinking the same thing. And when everybody's thinking the same thing, you get bubbles and you get crashes, right? So that is another aspect of the idea that the true edge here is understanding that, you know, 
we're optimized for a world that no longer exists, right? We are optimized for still being hunter gatherers on the plains and, and we're, we're not. <laughs> and, and, and yet our, our brains, the, the reptilian part of the brain is still very, very active. And what people don't know about emotions especially is emotions served a super high purpose for most of humanity, right? And that was get scared, run away, or fight, fight or flight, right? And if we didn't have that, we didn't have that emotional structure, which by the way, when it kicks in, it takes over your brain. And you literally, even if you are the, your executive brain, right, the prefrontal cortex, even if that's saying, this is the stupidest thing I could ever think of doing, you're still gonna do it. Because the emotional fear, the amygdala is saying, sorry guys, everything else is off the table, we are gonna react emotionally. And that, again, when you look at market history, going all the way back to the South Sea trading scandal, Isaac Newton lost a fortune, it's the same. It's the same. It hasn't changed at all. And so, you know, markets change, information changes, companies that are in and out of fashion change, right? But the underlying human reaction to it is the same. Now, the four horsemen of the investment apocalypse, fear, greed, hope, and ignorance. Think about that. Only one, ignorance, is not an emotion. Fear, greed, and hope have wiped out more portfolio value than any bear market ever, any market crash ever, right? And what's funny about it is, so the, what springs up? This whole school of thought they call behavioral finance, right? And, and I know a lot about behavioral finance because it's kind of my sweet spot, right? But I was thinking about it and realized, you know, we've had these studies for like 60 years and nothing changes, right? So what, what I'm noticing is there is information that is backed by a huge amount of empirical studies, right? And intellectually, right, we get it. We're like, yep, I get that. Yep, I understand that I'm gonna overreact. Yep, I won't do that. I promise I'm not gonna, over, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. And, and so that's the intellectual part when the when the crisis hits your emotions say oh yes you are going to do that and and then you, by the way to really complicate things you're going to invent a reason a logical reason for your behavior afterwards and finally one of the things i always say to people is one of the best things that you can do as an investor is to keep a journal a handwritten journal because what you're going to find you're going to be able to see a lot of these tricks that the brain plays on you right? One of the best is hindsight bias, where you literally, you literally Victim think that one. <laughs> yeah, you're not lying, though, right? Your brain reorganizes your memories so that they are cur current with what actually happened, right? And again, all sorts of studies prove this. I had it happen to me and because, you know, I thought that I, I, rem I misremembered something I did during the crash of 1987. And when I went back to my journal, I'm like, oh, damn, <laughs> I was wrong. And, and so when you, when you keep a written journal, right, you, there is your own handwriting calling you a liar. And, and it's not your fault. It's not any of our faults, right? I got asked by somebody to fill out a thing about, you know, what's your, what's your worst behavioral bias? And, and I answered being a human being <laughs> because we all have them. And we're all, we come out with pretty similar software in our brains and that's evolution. And that's, that's, that is right etched into your DNA. Mm -hmm. And so when you realize that, and when you realize that you're not special, if, if I, if I didn't have a quantitative discipline that kept me away from making emotional choices, I'm sure I would have panicked like during the financial crisis. I'm sure that I would have gotten greedy during the dot com, right? And, and because I realize that, it, it makes life a lot easier for me. And it actually calms you down, right? Because you see, look, you're not any different than anyone else. Because I often talk to people and they're like, no, no, Jim, I have the willpower. 
I had the willpower to to see my way through it. I just look at them and start to laugh. And it's like, no, you don't. I don't. Nobody does. And when you understand this emotional hijacking of the brain, you, you see, man, again, if you keep a journal, you see when you revisit emotional times, like say, let's say six months later, right? And you're looking at it and you're no longer emotional, right? All the cortisol has drained from your system. And you're looking at it and you're going, good God, did I like lose my mind? And the answer is, yeah, you did. The emotions hijacked it and you weren't in control. So I, I, one quick follow-up to that that I have to ask from, from a philosophical standpoint because it seems like technology is trying to uh, maybe catch up to your thesis potentially in the sense that, you know, you say, um, you know, it's heterogeneous ideas. And then as the information cascade starts to happen more and more, then the ideas or the things you start hearing people say is more homogeneous uh, in essence. So, I mean, would you say that maybe technology has, because everything's just, I mean, everything is growing exponentially from new tech that's out there, especially for what we do on a daily basis. Would you say that those information cascades, the time lapse from heterogeneous to homogeneous is going faster and faster? Or do, uh, or do I just have more of a bias right now because we're in an election year and the coronavirus is uh, causing me to even ask so, that question? <laughs> yeah, so so you, the latter statement has a big impact on your thinking right? Um, because of another bias, recency bias, right? right. Uh, we, we tend to think that whatever ha- is happening right now is going is going to continue to happen, you know, If it's bad, it's going to be bad forever. If it's good, it's going to be good forever. And that's wrong. Uh, But to to the first part of your question, yeah, maybe. I don't don't know. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. And I'm, again, it's like, uh, I I don't value my opinion very highly. Uh, I don't value other people's opinions very highly either. I mean, everyone has one, right? And, and it gets worse when like you're on social media and everyone thinks that they're an expert at everything and they're deluding themselves and and they're not. And so social media amplifies certainly, absolutely. Um, does it amplify for the good or for the bad? Almost always for the bad, right? Because again, we are fear-based creatures, creatures and you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And of course, now we've got a media that is trying to move over to a new investment model of how many clicks they get. And so they're not gonna do a headline that says everything is fine. No one's gonna read it, right? It, what, what the headline's gotta be is danger, danger. You know, you're gonna die. Everyone's gonna die. Hit the button. <laughs> and then, right? And so, you know, I've seen people who normally I would look at as very sober, kind of uh, thoughtful people literally melt down on social media, say, for example, over the coronavirus. They, they have melted down. And when you, when you expose yourself to this without a mindset or a mental model, and that's something we could talk like hours about because that's what I'm kind of obsessed with right now, um, with a mental model that is not calibrated right i guess is the nicest way i can put it and and if you have a poor calibration to your mental model you're you're going to let things external things control your your thoughts your emotions everything and and again if you if you know about history there are a bunch of guys in greece and rome called the stoics who you should read because they have a very good message for you and that is don't concern yourself at all or worry about something where your direct action can't change the outcome, right? So, so uh, you know, fill in the blank, crisis du jour. Uh, there's still a large percentage of us humans who think that, by golly, I can change that. And I can change it by going on Twitter and screaming. No, you can't. It only is gonna change you and for the worse because you're gonna, your, your decision-making is going to break down very badly and you're gonna make very bad decisions and then that compounds negatively, right? And so, yes, 
the it's still I'm still thinking about it, but I definitely see social media in particular as having an amplification effect on on market moves, um, speeding them up a little, right? Uh, because you know back in the day, you know you read a newspaper, you read a physical newspaper, right? And and things were slower. It's if you really want to just like kind of freak out, just go watch on YouTube. Watch like Eisenhower's farewell speech. Watch John Kennedy speak. And and you're going to think a lot of things. One of them is, God, we got a lot dumber over the last 60 years uh, than than these guys because the, the, but they had a different they had a different um, societal map, right? Things were much slower. You got you had time to think about things, and and now we've sort of put everything on a hair trigger, right? And I, I used to joke. Imagine if Twitter were around during the D-Day invasion. It would have failed. Because if you know your history, D-Day was a cluster you know what. <laughs> it, everything went wrong. They they dropped paratroopers miles from where they were supposed to be dropped. You know, they didn't have the appropriate number of ships. They everything was got screwed up. And yet it was the it was the invasion that turned the tide of the war and won it for the allies right and so because of this hyper uh, availability if you will what happens is we we tend to go looking for things that confirm our priors right and and so again social media you can find that real quick right and you can have it just be a member of your tribe and if and everything is an echo chamber and what happens, unfortunately, is that it doesn't change the quality of your decisions. It does change your certainty that you're right, right? And I'm never certain I'm right, ever. Everything is a probability, right? And so people will joke like, okay, come on, the, the, the sun's gonna come up tomorrow, right? And I went, yeah. That there is a 99.9999999% chance that it will, but there exists, however tiny, the chance that it won't. Now, does my mind get occupied by those things? Of course not, right? You can chunk them into, okay, that's so high probability, I don't have to worry about it. But that isn't the way the market works at all, right? So, so the market, the probabilities, man, if you're doing better than 60%, you you're doing really really well just because they're you know complex adaptive systems are really cool and they are modern society but they're also really fragile right and and people don't think about fragility when everything's going smoothly right well yeah that's great that's great that's great and then you know introduce uh, a new virus or introduce uh, you know whatever exogenous variable and people freak out and you know it's again it's a script and it's kind of like, uh, you know, I've, I've read some people who very uncharitably say that we're, we're, you know, robotic. In other words, we are so programmed with certain scripts. And I include myself in this, by the way. I'm not, I'm not saying other people, not me, right? Because that's a huge logical error right there. Uh, but we all are. And unless we take these steps, right, to, to, to safeguard ourselves from those errors, we're going to commit those errors right. because we're scripted. So it's interesting, you know, social media is the largest social experiment in history without a control group, unless I, you know, maybe the Amish, uh, but <laughs> we'll have to see, right? We'll have to see. That's for sure. So I know I only have you for a, a few more minutes, so I have two more questions for you real quick. Um, sure. One had to do uh, with one more quote that you said at that at that summit, and you said there that investing in microcaps are the last frontier in the United States. You know, and my thesis for this podcast is really all about educating the next generation of investors how to invest small micro nano cap stocks, and and the opportunities that this asset class really provides in creating and building wealth. You know, so I, I'm. This is really a question for you because I want some advice for myself. You know, I, I really want to know how we can, you know, focus. How how can I and those who focus specifically on the space, you know, do better job in promoting the benefits of the space? I mean, I think it's been well documented <laughs> about the the negatives 
Uh, yeah. There's a major motion picture about the negatives. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so how can we do a better job? So I, I think the way to do the better job is to lead by example. And by that, I mean, um, don't don't really care too much what other people when look when I, I, I call I call a certain class of person vampires and vampires are people who want to suck every positive energy out of you and because it makes them feel better. Avoid vampires. Right. And 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 avoid the nitpickers. But what about this? But what about this? But what about this? When you when you start seeing that, whether it's in person or online or whatever, their mind isn't going to get changed. They just want to fight. They and they and they, they it makes them feel good. It's a colossal waste of time. So so what do you do? You 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 lay out the benefits. I have a paper. Um, I don't know whether you've seen it or not, uh, but about why I love microcap. Um, you know, look at that. Look at the steps I, I point out in that. And, you know, they're kind of irrefutable. Right. And and then walk the walk. That's the thing. Right. So many people think that if they say something, well, there, that's done. Right. <laughs> no, no. You know, I, I have a thing that I say a lot and, it, and it's, uh, you know, Action without knowledge is foolish. Knowledge without action is futile, right? So what you want to do is you, you want to get the knowledge, and that's what you're doing with this podcast. You're, you're sharing knowledge, and you're sharing reasons for why people should get excited about this space, and I share them with you. Uh, but then then do it, right? That's that, if, I, if I ever had any kind of litmus test which separated people who succeeded from people who didn't, right? It's that the people who succeed take action in line with their thoughts, right? People, people, and oh, by the way, who own their failures, okay? People who don't succeed talk a lot, dream a lot, fantasize a lot. Oh, wouldn't it be great if do nothing, never get off the couch, Netflix and chill for the whole time, right? And whenever anything goes bad, they point the finger. It's somebody else's fault. You over there, you, you know, you caused this. I got to tell you, back to mental models, that's a really bad one. And I can pretty much assure you, you're going to fail badly. Right. Um, so keep doing what you're doing, point out the point out the good stuff. And then by the way, uh, you know, may, maybe one of your podcasts is just you and you go over, hey, here's something that really was did really well for me. But also, by the way, here's something that were, really didn't go my way, <laughs> because there's a lot to learn from that, too. Right. When 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 things when you fail and or a stock purchase fails or whatever, it's information rich. Oh, yeah. And what do we do? We try to sweep it under the, the rug. Don't do that. Speaking of which, that leads to my final question. It's my favorite question I always ask. What investing experience would you say impacted you the most in your career? Definitely uh, the one I wrote about um, uh, during the crash of 1987. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was not fully a quant then. I was 27 years old. I, w I had developed, um, I'm kind of uh, a fan of, uh, you know, mathematical models and things like that. And so I was, I was trading options and using, uh, using a model that was based on implied volatility from the Black Scholes, uh, option pricing model, right? Um, there's a lot, or excuse me, there was a lot of information in that. That's one other thing I'll sneak in. If it's a mathematical anomaly and somebody talks about it, it goes away. If it's a behavioral anomaly and somebody talks about it, it stays the same, right? Because behavior. Anyway, I had amassed for a young guy, 27, uh, you know, with uh, a son already and and another one coming soon. And, and uh, so young guy married, one child uh, already, a son, a daughter on the way. Uh, but I had amassed this, my largest position ever in puts going into the 1987 crash, right? And... The day before the crash, I panicked and sold them all. 
Okay. So the amount of money, I still won't even look at it because the <laughs> amount of money I would have made had I kept those puts was a small fortune. And, but, so I look at it as like the best thing that could have ever happened to me, right? Because it cemented in my mind that, okay, Mr. High and Mighty thinks a lot of himself. You're gonna react emotionally just like everybody else. You gotta figure a way to short circuit that, that out because if you don't, this is just gonna keep happening. And, and so not only did it teach me a lot personally, right, about uh, conviction, about, uh, about figuring out ways to not get in your own way, but it, it literally changed my, I, I, it firmly cemented my search for only quantitative methods, right? So I, I actually wrote about it um, and I think I put it up on Twitter um, but man, when it happened, I can't tell you how sorry I was for myself. It was it's like, my wife said, uh, you know, uh, like a week after she's looking at me and she goes, you just have to stop. You got to stop <laughs> because you know, I was, I was telling her what, how much money I would have made. <laughs> she's just like, just shut up, man. You didn't do it. You so forget about it. Move on. Um, and when I did move on, it's kind of like, and by the way, that was what I was referring to when I said I misremembered uh, with hindsight bias. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. thought that uh, that I had uh, hold, held those puts longer than I actually had. <laughs> and it was actually going back to the trading journal that I was talking about and advocate people keep. There where I thought, oh, damn. <laughs> and, you know, the mind does that, right? Because we need an illusion of control. If we don't. Listen, you want to you want a really freaky human being out? Take away his or her illusion of control. Boom. That you know, uh, you you can literally make them go insane. I think that's a great way to end it right there. Before I let you go, I also wanted to give a quick shout out. Uh, huge fan of your son's podcast, and that's like the best by Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Massive fan, listen to it all the time. As well as Jamie Catherwood's uh, the weekly. Uh, history lessons. I, they're just, it's, it's great. So, so I just wanted to make sure I had that out there, you know. That's as, awesome. Yeah. And, you know, Jamie and I have a new podcast, Infinite Loops. That's right. Uh, so, uh, we, our first episode, well, our first episode was a kind of a gag episode with um, Ramp Capital and Super Mugatu. Uh, we were, uh, which was fun, which was really fun. Oh, our first, our best. first, our first real episode was with Jim Chanos. Yeah. And we learned a lot. Cool. Well, with that, Jim, thank you so much for joining me. You're a legend. I I'm so appreciative of your time, and uh, I look forward to our next chat. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Cheers.